Hi, this is Peter Lemangelo. I just did a show that was more fun than I could describe with Matt on digging in. It tells a lot about my ups and downs, but how much fun I had throughout my whole life being in show business. So I uh, hope you enjoy the show. All right, welcome back, everybody. I have a really interesting guest today. His name is Peter Lemangelo, and listen to this, okay? This is a long, long intro, I'm sorry, but first ever to sell one million albums on television, but she'll tell that story. Uh, appeared on over every major television show, 25 Tonight Show appearances. Yes. Amazing. Uh, been featured in every major publication in the US and Europe. Household name, and this is very cool. Led to being the only singer ever to be a ever to be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So this guy's been around. People know who he is. His stories are going to be amazing. Um, some special stories. I think some uh, some unexpected stories we're going to hear. And the last thing is sold out Carnegie Hall, sold out Madison Square Garden, sold out Lincoln Center for performing arts, countless other places, Atlantic City, Vegas. Welcome aboard. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. This is you, right? Yeah, talking about the right guy? Although when you read it, uh, I, I listen to it as if you're talking about someone else. It doesn't feel well. I mean, you've 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 done all these like amazing, amazing things, and it's kind of cool. I guess to look back, right, and hear somebody talk about you. Um, you know, it's really strange because you don't think about it all the time. So yeah. uh, when something like that occurs, where somebody introduces you, um, it's like you're saying to yourself, "Oh yeah, he's talking about me," and then all of a sudden it comes all. It's like you're. Your whole life flashes in front of you, and you start right. remembering all the things you spoke about. It's nostalgic, right? Yes, I mean, it because, is, actually. So, and I want you to be nostalgic, because I want to hear some really cool stories. Okay. But um, I was mentioning to you before, you know, we're doing this because as you tell your stories, you, you had a beginning. You had to work through some, there were some challenges. There were things in your life, you know, that you experienced. And I think people can relate to that. So many people have challenges, right? So it's not just the success I just read. It's, let's talk about the things that you really went through before you became who you became, uh, at least publicly. You know? And that's where people are going to get some motivation from this conversation, maybe inspiration, you know, maybe some lessons, maybe some failures, some successes. Let's, uh, we do this to help people. That's why we do it. Well, there uh, Take me back to the beginning. There are eight million stories in the Naked City. Which one do you want to start with? I want to start with what you were telling me earlier. You grew up. Um, you, had, you had an experience. I mean, there was an experience that... From living in New York, growing up, um, you know, I think you said your father had passed away when you were young. Yes. But that all shaped everything that happened after that. Well, I think the experiences you have shape the rest of your life, whether you uh, care to admit it or not. For example, I lost my father when I was nine years old. He was 39, died of cancer. And instantly I started to be more emancipated and grown up than a nine-year-old normally is. Was it just you? Uh, no, I had a, an older brother. Okay. So you were nine, he was? He was 11. 11, yes. okay. That's uh, a tough age. I mean, that right there is like traumatic. Right. But he and I were so different. He was a, an incredibly gifted athlete, ended up to be the one of the greatest professional bowlers that ever lived. Really? Uh, uh, won the U.S. Open and the PBA National. He has as many uh, PBA titles as Don Carter, if you remember that name. Uh, but totally sports oriented. He played stickball, he played uh, all the sports of the season in the middle of our street on Jane Drive in North Babylon. Whether it was stickball or basketball or hockey or uh, football, I did none of that. I had no interest in any of it. So I would cut lawns and wax people's cars and sell magazines door to door. Uh, anything I could do to try to generate money. And it wasn't because uh, my mother asked me to help her earn money to support the two of us. It's I was motivated to do it because I wanted to get somewhere. And I really didn't know where I wanted to get to, but I had that kind of feeling that I wanted to be independent. I think that was because I was so insecure when my father died as to what life would be like Without anyone, without, without yeah. anyone to yeah. guide me yeah. and, and help me. Did you feel like you were on your own? Do you remember that? Like, was your your mom was there? Oh yeah. Well, was she, she was, capable, or were you? Did oh, you really feel like you were on your own? No, she was so capable of handling the both of us. This was an inner feeling I had. 
to do something with my life, to accomplish something. Yeah. I didn't want to do something that was just a waste of time. Like, well, I mean, like a lot of people who aren't gifted in sports still play sports. But I knew for me that would be a waste of time. Right, right. All right. So I, I had that But you knew time. to work. Like, you, you knew I had that feeling. Yeah, I really did go out from an early it. age. And, uh, and nobody was telling you to do it. Like, no. You just knew. Yeah. No, I was motivated to do that because I felt that uh, that would make me feel good about myself if I accomplished something I could consider tangible. You're and saying that, that in hindsight. You didn't know. I mean, that's, that's very intuitive to know that you did that to feel good about yourself because I can relate to that because I had the same experience as you. Okay. And I did the same thing. I said it in the past tense, but in the present tense, that's how I felt. It's I wanted intuitive. to feel inco- accomplished. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to just waste my time. Uh, looking back, it's easy to say it. Uh, it made me feel good, but uh, it made me feel good at the moment as well. Because you said to me before, but so you, I'm sure at the time you didn't think about this, but you had this sense of time was moving faster, maybe than because it, because your father died young. Well, I do and so the that. clock was faster up here. I believe that people who have their parents to later on in their lives have a lot more patience than people who lose their parents early because we all feel that it's very possible that we're going to die young because that example was set for me. And I've had friends of mine whose parents lived into the 90s. They're the most patient people I ever met because even though we were in school together, they always had their parents there. I got to tell you, I can relate to that sense of urgency. So I told you I was 12 when my father died. And at 25, I, I bought my first life insurance policy. Well, I didn't know. I still have it. No. Nobody I knew was doing that. And everybody was like, why are you buying that? Nobody I know bought one at 25 and still has it. So that's pretty good it's on your 30 part. bucks a month. It's a great deal. <laughs> but I had it. And I always felt like my clock was going to run out at 42. And when I turned 42, I actually began counting the months. This is true. And then I began counting the days. And then when I lived longer, I was like, I made it. And so I, I lived like that until I was 42 and, and, and X amount of months. So I know exactly what you mean. Great observation. I it's very thought that. weird. And I felt like I was running towards something the whole time. I was running as fast as I could, trying to get as much as I could done, make some money and build a life and do it all. And that was the reason. I had, that came out of therapy, by the way. I, wasn't, I didn't just figure it out. <laughs> so as my brother pursued sports and eventually found bowling at age 15 and okay. just skyrocketed, to fame. He was the youngest PBA champion at 20 years old, the youngest national champion on ABC Wide World of Sports. So it, this was pretty big time. What, what, what year was that? Uh, first title was 1965. Okay, so that was 1965. Yeah, he was 20. I found my niche in playing the drums and then having a little rock band when I was 12, 13. Self taught? Oh, yeah. No kidding. Yes, absolutely self taught. Uh, Eventually, the Beatles happened in 1964. And all the instrumental bands, and they were almost all the instrumental bands in those days, realized that everybody had to sing. So they started asking each other in the band, all the guitar players, do you sing, do you sing? Yeah, could somebody sing? Yeah, and, and I was the only one who could sing pretty well. That's how Don Henley be, became a singer, too. Is that right? Like, yeah, because okay. he's a drummer, you know, yeah. from the Eagles. And so all of a sudden, I was singing... Uh, more and I cared more about that than I did playing the drums. But what started to bother me, and this is as I was sixteen. You didn't know you could sing. Oh, I knew I could sing. Oh, you knew. Yeah, but I never told anybody. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes I would surprise people because I would sing at a birthday. I'd sing happy birthday at a birthday party. Uh, hey, well, who's this? I take the lead, and everybody would say, "Wow, that's pretty good." You know, and that will turn your head. Although I do wonder how some singers get encouraged because they're so bad that I'm trying to figure out who encouraged them. It's the opposite. Yeah. It's like you shouldn't be saying. Yeah. Uh, But anyway, I used to get encouraged um, and I was grateful for that. But what happened was as I got to be 16, 17, I uh, noticed that the guitar players were blocking me and so were my cymbals. So I wasn't getting the girls I wanted to get because I couldn't get their attention. So I decided maybe I should try being a stand-up singer in front of the of the band. So I got myself a band that had its own drummer, and I ended up doing stand-up singing for the first time. And I got a lot more attention. I started to think about the possibility of having a career at it. 
and I was doing really well when I was 18 years old, 18, 18 and a half. I met an agent in New York, and he actually uh, got me an audition at the Copacabana. And I won. What a good time to be at the Copacabana. Oh, that was, that was the heyday. Wow. And it was just so incredible. So you saw Sinatra. Everybody. Saw everybody, Martin, you could possibly, Davis. everybody you could possibly think of. Uh, in that whole era. And so I win the spot of the production singer. In those days, they had about a 10-girl chorus line that was, okay. was the appetizer for the opening act. It was always singer, right. comic, comic, yeah. singer. But they always had... The Copa always had this production number or several numbers prior to the opening act coming on. And they had a male singer in that production number. And I won that spot. And it paid $875 a week. And I knew I was going to meet everybody, everybody in the show business because the Copa Cabana was such a mecca in those days that anybody in the business who was anybody participated and, uh, you know, Went to all the shows. So, but that was your first real. That was my gig? first. You went from almost you know, from playing the drums to, to that yeah, was your exactly. first real gig. I met this agent and that's Bing. A, I was, you know, gig. I mean, I was so in awe of just holding the microphone, saying, "My God, Sinatra sung on this, and so did Sammy Davis and that yeah. King Cole." Yeah. So, yes, it happened very quickly. That was the good side. And you were eighteen. I was almost nineteen. Before I got the job, before I would start, I had to wait for the other guys run to finish because they ran about a six week uh, uh, run before they would change to a new act. I got drafted. The worst thing that could possibly happen to anybody who's not uh, uh, wanting to be GI Joe. It depends on your Did you go? frame. I had to go. I mean, my father was in World War II and uncles and- So you went to Vietnam? Yes, sir. And so uh, there I was. Uh, missing it all. My career ended immediately while I was in. I was miserable. I mean, I didn't want to be in the service. I mean, I just. Were you uh, actually in combat? Absolutely. No kidding. Yeah. And so it, uh, you just took my life a couple of clicks forward. No, go back. Slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Slow <laughs> down. But anyway, I just had to accept it yeah. because first of all, there's, is a thing people don't realize. In those days, if you got drafted and you refused to go, you had to go to Leavenworth for three to five years. So it didn't give you much of a choice. So it wasn't always a question of people being patriotic. I mean, the, you didn't have a choice. What was it going to be? To go to Leavenworth, run to Canada, or do my duty, as it's called. But the truth is that I did feel some kind of an obligation not to resist. I guess that's because my uncles and my father and Cousins uh, had all served in World War II in Korea, right. and I almost felt like, well, I guess this is what I have to do. I didn't like it at all, but I decided. That's scary. I mean, it, it, oh, it's worse than that. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I used to tell people when I, when I first got in the service, they said, uh, you know, how do you like it? I said, well, I would have liked it fine if I was 12, because when you're 12, you want to play uh, Cowboys and Indians, and you want to play Army and G.I. Joe, and... You know, we, we moved out to a development in Long Island that was technically just being built. So they were digging cesspools and there were piles of dirt. I mean, I had more fun playing Army when I was 9, 10, 11, and 12 than you can imagine. But when I was 19, I didn't want to play Army. So it was really difficult. Yeah, yeah. Plus, everything I dreamed about stopped short. And How the, much time did you have before had you had to go? No, he gave me about five, six weeks notice. That was it. Yeah, maybe it was less than that. You know, did you, you get to sing there before you had to go at the no. Copa? It never, so it didn't actually happen. It never happened. Uh, you know, everybody has stories. Uh, you know, am I allowed to uh, say a phrase? Well, if you, you don't like it, you, you can cut it out. There's an old expression nurses get knocked up, quarterbacks get knocked down, and somebody invented the Etzel. Yeah, and we're leaving that in. Everybody misses. <laughs> but everybody misses I, yeah. nobody's life yeah. just goes in a perfect sequence and you just keep getting bigger and better and, and smarter you know I mean everybody falls back and, and then uh, has to regroup so that was, that's huge disappointment oh the biggest put, put aside the reason like that's huge disappointment and maybe you're thinking is this ever going to happen again am I going to get a second chance yeah because first of all being drafted in itself is the most traumatic thing that could ever happen to you just being healthy 
and an American, they're going to take you away from your life and tell you what to do, tell you where to sleep, how to eat, when to eat, and eventually tell you you're going to have to go fight a war that you don't even... I didn't even know that there was a North and South Vietnam. They didn't tell us that. They didn't tell us anything. When I got there, the sergeant said that we were all assembled on a concrete slab. <clears throat> 200 of us got off our plane, and there was a group of 200 waiting to get on the plane to go home who had served their year already. And he said, welcome to South Vietnam. That's the way the sergeants speak. And I looked at this guy next to me, and I said, Louis, South Vietnam? I mean, there's a North Vietnam? I mean, I didn't even realize we were involved in the Civil War or anything. They don't tell you anything. How long was, this, was the, the One training year. camp? Like, did, did, there was no right trial. Oh, eight Is it weeks, gun go? No, eight weeks basic training, weeks. and then eight more weeks of what they call individual this advance. Yeah. How long did you guys go to training camp for, the Marines? Three months. Well, okay. Paris Island is totally different. Yeah, yeah. First of all, we used to call you guys the hired killers. <laughs> but, but yes, the Marines has to. And even in Vietnam, uh, GIs, meaning Amer uh, soldier, uh, Army personnel, served uh, one year. The Marines had to serve 13 months. They always have to do bigger, bit, better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's so all right. You, that's, you, wow. Don't so forget, Marines volunteer. Big difference. OK. I was oh, drafted. It's a huge difference. Yeah, big difference. I mean, they want to go. That's right. If you volunteer, then I don't blame you for being gung ho and you know liking it. Uh, but it's totally different when it's foisted upon you. So that was a tough. So that, that that's like a how do you? That was how a, do you even do? So five I, weeks, I six weeks? You said? Well, you do eight, eight weeks, weeks basic training, then another eight weeks of advanced in individual training. Okay. So and then months, you're on four well, months. Four months. Four months. And then uh, you know they give you a month off to go home and cry. And then you're out. And then you have to get a, a permanent station. And mine was Fort Jackson, South Carolina. But then I came down on a levee. My number and name came down on the levee. And now I had to go do a year in Vietnam. What was your job? Uh, well, everybody starts with what they call 71B10, which is infantry. But uh, I eventually got myself a job in uh, through politicking as a clerk typist for a colonel. York, of course. <laughs> uh, I met this colonel, he was walking around, and I started talking to him, and I found out he was probably really good in combat, you know, uh, but he couldn't write a letter. So I talked to him into letting him be his clerk, and I just, it was just wonderful. I was going to finish out my time uh, working nine to five and, uh, and just tolerating it and then going home. No, I came down on a levy, and before you know it. What is a levy? A levy mean? means that General Westmoreland, the commanding general at the time, went to President Johnson and said, we're doing really good, but I need another 100,000 guys. So they hit the button on the computer, and everybody who falls into that, they need so many of this and so many of that. And it's probably alphabetical. And I... And You're in the middle. So I was right there. L was number 16, I guess. Uh, and there I was. You out. And there I am. And before you know it, I'm in a place that you can't describe. What was your job at that point? Um... Originally, it was supposed. I, I thought I was going to be in uh, uh, in the clerk field, in other words, but that's not so great. Sounds good in the states. You're in an office. There, you have a portable typewriter, and you're in the thick of it. So I didn't really want to be a, a company clerk um, because that's pretty dangerous too. So I wrote letters all over the place, and I got myself into special services. And it backfired because I thought that was going to be fabulous. I'd be singing, doing shows. Well, it's true that you know, I, Bob Hope. Yeah, but that's see, Bob Hope went under the USO auspices right, right. to all the most secure places possible. Right. We were soldier shows, and we went to anywhere they wanted to send us. So you did end up doing that. Yeah. Okay. For for two months, no matter how dangerous, no matter how awful it was. I mean, we, we had to live through uh, mortar and rocket attacks because we were in base camps. Trying, you know, we were shipped there for a couple of days to entertain the troops, but we had to live through what they lived through. So it was really awful. And uh, now I finally, uh, the unthinkable happens, I make it through, and I get out. I lived through the Tet Offensive of 1968, which was the worst five days I could ever describe. Did you have to pick up a gun and fight? Sure. You had to. 
Yeah, it I sounds mean, like you might have been fortunate enough to have been able to almost you know, be a little protected from that. In the movie uh, Private Ryan, Saving Private Ryan, Saving yeah. Private Ryan, the uh, company clerk that he wants to take with him because he speaks German. Yes, he yes, says, I remember. Yeah, you're coming with me. He says, "Well, I'm a clerk." He said, "Did you go to basic training?" I said, "Yeah." yeah. Here's your gun. Did you Did you fire your weapon? He said, "Yeah." He says, "Come with me." Yeah, you know, yeah. because everybody starts off with a basic, what they call MOS, my, uh, military occupational skill, is combat. You know what I mean? Infantry. So can't so escape it. To, can't to. escape it. So anyway, I make it back to Long Island. I get I, uh, pretty well unscathed. I, I, How about up here? Yeah, no. No. I didn't get away with that. No. Okay. Uh, I was as screwed up as anybody coming back. Uh, mad at the world. Uh, nightmares. Uh, do you still have that? Sometimes. You do? Yeah. Uh, I lived through a terrible Agent Orange experience, which gave me heart trouble and everything else. But uh, now I'm back, and uh, I couldn't be happier. And I, I thought that I was able to just divorce myself from what I had gone through, as if it never happened. Put it on the back burner of my mind, not think yeah, about it. But it was trauma. I mean, not easy to do. Yeah, I mean, you fool yourself and things like yeah. that. Yeah. And so now I'm free. 21, I have a chance to be a singer again. But the first realization was when you try to pursue a singing career on that level is that if you don't have any money, there's no way to pursue it if you try to work a job. And you would get, you would get caught in a trap if you tried to work a job because you'd never have the time to pursue it and be available. Anthony? Anthony? <laughs> we were talking about being yeah, available. Yeah, yeah. And so, my biggest mystery was, how can I make enough to survive on, but only give up about two days a week, so that I'd have the rest of the time to try to pursue my career? And as soon as my career took off, I wouldn't have to do that anymore. So, that's a very tall order. But a friend of mine said, you know what you could do? I was telling him, I said, I gotta find something I can do for two days a week. And in those days, make about 150 a week to live on. This is still in the 60s. Yeah, 68. Yeah. Uh, he said, you know, develop an egg route. A what? An egg route. Like deliver an eggs? Yeah. Okay. And I said, there's money in that? He said, well, there's no money in it if you just deliver them. But if you buy and sell them, there is money in there. So I drove upstate New York to, uh, this is corny as could be, but Old McDonald's Farm is the first sign I see. Yeah, like the real one. Yeah. <laughs> right, the face yeah. song on it. And I go in, I meet the guys who own it, and I tell them what I'm trying to do, and they say, oh, we're going to help you. Yeah, sure. Um, one of the guys was a veteran. He said, okay, well, what do you need? I said, well, how many eggs would I have to sell to make $150 for myself? And they said, well, it's 30 dozen in a case. You have to probably sell about five cases, six cases in order to make 180 and then clear 150 after your expenses. So that sounds pretty good. Okay. So I try it. I buy six cases of eggs and I go around and first I try delicatessens on Long Island. And then I tried supermarkets, but they were they were too tough to get into. Wait, you bought the eggs, you brought them back with you. Yeah. And, and I had some a certain amount of time to sell them. I was just saying, I had some fits. So they this, go back. This story has to be very quick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because otherwise, I would have lost the money I spent on the age. So I went to delis, and that didn't. they only bought um, half a case a, a week. And so they expected you to load them into their refrigerators. It was too time-consuming. And, and God forbid they had a customer in the store, or 20 of them, when you went to get paid, you had to wait for them to finish every customer That's before the time. guy would even look up at you. You know what I mean? You couldn't yeah, say, yeah. excuse me a minute, folks, let me get this guy. Never. They, uh, it's amazing how when uh, you become subservient to someone like that, they really stick it to you. They really do. They, they can really, sense it. They Some really let you hand. know yeah. that they're here and you're there. So I decided to dump the delis and I went to diners. Because a lot of yeah. diners on Long Island. Yeah. And they move stuff fast. Yeah, and they buy 
10 cases a month, a week, I'm sorry. So I said, wow, 10 cases a week, this is really good. Uh, but there's jeopardy here. They buy 10 cases a week. See, I wanted to buy them and deliver them within two days, make my money and go back into show business the other five days. So I couldn't get involved in too big a thing for two reasons. One, because the delis only paid on the first of the month. So I had to carry them. If they wanted 10 cases a week, Whoa. I had to finance 40 cases. Right, right. At the time, they were about $26 a case. So I had to finance that, and I didn't have that. And I had no way to carry them back from upstate New York. I was York. wondering how you're doing all this back and forth. All right. So see, each thing creates another problem. Yeah. And uh, I found that now I need a truck. And I need a truck, and I need a, um, a refrigeration unit to put on the truck right, to keep right, the eggs right. fresh. Then a place to park the truck. And I, a friend of mine owns a gas station. I said, can I pay you to plug in to your gas and park my truck there and then drive my car up to it, pull the eggs out, go deliver them? And come? Yeah, sure. So we make a deal. After a while, I'm doing better selling eggs than he is in the gas station. So he says to me, and now I've crossed the threshold. The biggest fear that I had is gone. I now know that not only can I pursue show business because I can earn money to support myself very quickly, but I'm not dependent on anybody anymore. I actually could be independent. And you went out and you were a sales guy because you had to go to the diners. Oh, yeah, yeah, but it gets worse than that. you had to convince them to trust you. They didn't know who you are. Well, of course. Then nobody knew me. Right. And they wouldn't even talk to you originally. You know, when I say, how much do you pay for eggs? That was my opening line. Boy, if they're busy, they, yeah, you, yeah. Know, you know, how we are, it's like a guy doing telemarketing today, you know, how much tolerance you have for that. <laughs> anyway, I overcame all of that. Now I start feeling really good about myself. Instead of feeling insecure, how am I ever going to make it as a singer if I can't even support myself, you know, uh, to live? And now I'm thinking, a little on the entrepreneurial side, wow, if I devote three days a week, I can live pretty well. And I was willing to shelve show business aside a little bit. Uh, you know, was somebody. that the first taste of having a little money? Yes. In your life? Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Ever. So I make a deal to trade half my egg business for half the gas station. Okay. Okay. He only leased the gas station from a company called BP, which nobody knew then. Yeah. All right. And... Uh, Instantly, I learned about the gas station business. And also, I realized if I use the eggs as a leader item to get women to buy gas there, we, we, our numbers would go up selling gas. So I started talking to all the women coming in. Uh, let me give you a dozen eggs. They only cost me about 12 cents, 13 at the time. Little peewee eggs we used to use. Uh, well, uh, eggs are based size based on the age of the chicken. Nobody knows, but I pee just learned something. I, I yeah, peewees are when they first somebody, lay. Can somebody Google that really quick? Is that true? Yeah, well, it's true. <laughs> peewees are when they first start to lay, and then if you go down the line, they get. Karen, the, is that true? By the way, they get the small, medium, large, extra large, and then when you hear this, then jumbo, which are the worst eggs you could ever buy. That's the oldest chicken. Yeah, because chicken's <laughs> older. It forever to get that big. Yeah, but there's, the chicken's older. The nutrients are gone. And the, the step after um, jumbo eggs is Heinz. Wait, the worst eggs are jumbo when they cost the most. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not buying jumbo anymore. Of course. It's like uh, right. if you think in a, uh, in a middle-class neighborhood you can sell brown eggs, you're nuts because you won't sell one. You know what I mean? They have yeah, to be white yeah, and they have yeah. to be big. Yeah. Okay. You know, you know, okay. So <laughs> it's the worst, but it's the best. <laughs> So now so I got, sell them to the ladies. Now I get all the women, all your old women coming in to buy gas because they like the eggs I gave them. Yeah. And now I'm selling them eggs and they're happy as hell. I'm selling them tri packs, you know, and all that. Yeah. A guy comes in from the Board of Health. I'm sitting in my little gas station. He goes, What are you doing? You can't sell eggs here. I said, Why not? He said, Your gas station. I said, So? They're eggs. They're not, what do you think? They're not scrambled eggs. They're not liquid. I said, well, what the hell are you talking about? 
He said, you can't. I said, well, then go across the street to the AMP. Does anybody here know what an AMP is? Yeah, I'm from Jersey. It's all over the place, yeah. I said, you tell them if I can't sell eggs, because obviously they're the ones that blew the whistle on me, you tell them they can't sell oil. Okay. How can they sell oil if I can't sell eggs? So what happened? He left. (laughs) He said, geez, you got a point there. (laughs) So he stopped breaking our chops and off he went. And now I make it not just eggs, but butter and milk. And bread. And nobody was doing that at gas stations nobody. at the time. I mean, now every gas station's got a little shop. But now they that, do. nobody was doing that. There were no 7-Elevens. There were, you know, I mean, this is the birth of... You were the first Wawa. Yeah, first, <laughs> the first Wawa. Very good. Okay. All right. So now the entrepreneurial part is now I, I buy a Cadillac. I buy you did. A, I buy a four-bedroom colonial. I mean, I'm really well, doing... Well, you're in your good. 20s. Well, I'm 23 now by 1970. And you bought a Cadillac when you were 23. Yeah. Well, that's pride. Let me tell you why. Because when you're in show business and you're not getting anywhere, everybody makes you feel lousy. All your friends say, you still singing? Thank you. Am I still singing? That's a nice compliment. And you still eating hot dogs? Hey, I went to see Humper Dink the other night. Thanks. I needed to hear that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know no, I don't, people, but I, know, I, can, I understand you, what you're saying. You know how people can <laughs> yeah. be. Because right? I can't sing, so I can't relate. So... Just for my pride, yeah, I bought yeah, a Cadillac yeah. and I bought a really nice house. And on the island, yeah, it's the, it's the same place. Okay, yeah. Now I'm not North Babylon anymore. Now I live in Isla. Okay. And my gas station is in East Isla. Okay. And then I buy the gas station across the street, and I start having a price war between my own two gas stations. What I do is when I want this one to do well, I raise the price over here. And then the more gas I sell, the cheaper the company sells me the gas for. And if you sell enough of it, they don't charge any rent. So I can manipulate the price. Yeah. So uh, you, your rent is based on how little gas or how much gas. If you sell over 30,000 gallons a month, you get free rent. So that's a goal you have to reach. So I start to manipulate the price of gas on both sides. So you're 23, you got two gas stations. Yep. You're competing with yourself. And an egg business that's right. doing really pretty good. And the good. food business. And a little little food business. Yeah. Not, not major, but a little bit. But I'm having more fun than you can believe. I can't wait to get up in the morning and do that. I don't even want to go to sleep. I'm wait, like, wait. Where, so you were still singing, though, somewhere in there. Yeah, but you want to know the truth? It was more comical than you could believe. For example, I still kept pursuing singing. And I would get something to happen every now and then. Uh, like 1971, I got my first Tonight Show. Who does that? You know, I mean, what? Well, just uh, randomly while you were doing no. gas stations? I auditioned 15 times for the Tonight Show and I never got it uh, because it, AGVA, the American Guild of Variety Artists, forced them to audition anybody who was a member if they wanted to keep paying 320 to no matter who was on. So I kept auditioning and I never got it. But I knew that Fred DeCordova, the producer of Tonight Show at the time, that he liked me. Because always saw he'd come up and talk to me afterwards. He said, I'm not going to put you on, but I like you. <laughs> Bring him some eggs. <laughs> yeah. Well, I get a job at the Rainbow Grill in Manhattan. Uh, 65th floor of the NBC building. The Rainbow Room? Rainbow Grill. Okay. There was a Rainbow Grill and a Rainbow, Rainbow Room. The Rainbow Room was a catering, restaurant catering. The Rainbow Grill okay. was their nightclub. Okay. So you know, a lot of people that, oh, are, I mean, that, that was like. This was a coup. Even Regis used to be there. Yeah. We won't mention that the reason I got in there was because of Joe Colombo, but that's all right. We'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> well, who the hell? I figure I get in there. <laughs> right. I invite Fred the Cordova to come up, and I said, look, Fred, I will never bother you again. If you see me in front of an audience and you don't like me, I'll never bother you again. I just want you to see me. Not just with a piano in this. Give me one shot. Dead room. I just want one chance to show you what I could do. By the third song, you went like this to me. That Wednesday, I was on the Tonight Show. So things were happening that encouraged my singing career, too. Where'd you get the songs from? Where did I get the songs from? Well, in those days, what I did was I stayed away from male singers because I didn't want to be compared to anybody. So I did female singer hits or... um, Songs that were dated with a new version, you know, almost like cover songs yeah, yeah, yeah. with a new version. Um, so where were so I? So you picked some songs that 
I mean, those those are hands picked, obviously. Well, they're, they're, these are the best songs for the Tonight Show. This is even more first... comical. Now I get on the Tonight Show. Fred Decorder says, "What are you going to say?" I sang the same song, the Burt Background song. I'll never fall in love again. Every audition, same one. And he used to say to me, "Why do you keep singing the same song?" I said, "Because I figured maybe after a while you'll get to like it because that's the way music Your parents, is." Yeah, good at you it. Know, you know, there were songs that when I was a kid I heard it on the radio, I didn't like it, but then after 38 times, I bought it. That's so know? true. Okay. It really is. So I kept singing the same song. And now I get on the Tonight Show, and in rehearsal, I'm getting ready to rehearse with Doc Severinsen and the NBC Orchestra, and he says, what are you going to sing? I said, uh, I'll never fall in love. He goes, oh, good. I said, good. I said, you kept turning me down. He said, oh, I like the song. Anyway, that's the way life can be. So that was your so that and was now your first show. I make friends. Swing. I make that's almost at the same time. I make friends with the programming director of WNEW, big middle of the road station, not the biggest rocker, the big rock station in New York was two point seven ABC. Well, there was no FM. Oh, oh this is before FM. Yeah, <laughs> you're getting ahead of me. What yeah. was before FM? Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, I'm really, I, I'm really getting to the point where he might play one of my records. That's a big station. I mean, it's yeah. no, I mean that, that's, a, yeah, that's uh, a big name. William B. Williams was on yeah. it. Julie Sorosa. Yeah. There was some, uh, Ken, uh, uh, the guy that had Green Door. Jim Lowe. They all had shows on the radio. Anyway, I make a record on my own, and they start playing it. And if you can believe this story, I'm pumping gas into a guy's convertible, and my record goes on the radio. I know. Uh, the best you can ever Can you still seen. feel it as you're saying it? Oh, yeah. yeah. But I'm not going to tell him, because he's going <laughs> to tell me I'm full of, you know. Yeah. He's not going to believe it. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, okay. but yeah, yeah, he's going to buy that. He wants right? an eggs? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I would get encouraged, and then I'd go months with nothing. Uh, I did the Tonight Show, and nothing came from it. Uh, no record company approached me or anything like that. So uh, I'd go back to my egg business. And after a while, not just eggs and gas stations, I meet a guy who owns a laundromat, and I buy into his laundromat. And I'm doing That's this. Cash business. I, well, yeah, because yeah. that was a cash cow. Yeah. And I start to realize it's a lot less labor in a laundromat than there is in the gas stations. No labor at all because I wasn't fixing the cars. Right. You know, we hired guys, for people for that. But the egg business was laborious, so you had to really do a lot of work. It was growing. The egg business was growing. Yeah, and the reason it grew I'm was because egg this is great. I got away from the diners. Yeah. I'm driving down this place called Sunrise Highway on Long Island. Yeah. And I see a farm stand. And it's a hundred cars. I said, what the heck? So I pull in and I ask to see the owner. And he's selling fruits and vegetables. And obviously he's doing a bang up business. I said, you ever think of selling eggs? He's not nah, too much aggravation because I don't have any place to put them. I said, well, suppose I put a refrigerator in here. You know, a case like they have in the deli. It's a 35 yeah. cubic foot yeah. refrigerator. And I'll, I'll lease it to you for a year, for a dollar. And I'll load it up with 35 cases of eggs. And, uh, or 10 cases, that's what would fit. And uh, whatever you sell, you pay me for. And if you don't sell them, after a week, I'll take them back and give you fresh ones. He said, well, what would happen? And now I got a chance to sell a hell of a lot of eggs in one spot. Yeah. And they're... A lot of uh, it's on farm- a main road. Oh yeah, and there's a yeah. lot of farm stands on Long Island at the time, between Nassau and Suffolk County, just uh, hell, hell of a lot. So now I can consolidate my get away from those diners. The diners are the worst in the world because they say they pay on the first of the month. They don't pay for three weeks, so now you got to carry them three weeks more before you get your money. So that's a tough group to do business with. So. Now I'm going to do farm stand. Question. What happens if I get broken eggs? I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I'm not going to handle eggs like the delicate. You know, it says people break eggs. And then I said, what? let me find out. I'll get back to you. So I'm at the gas station. And who's there but a guy who owns a bakery from across the street? And he says to me, uh, I said, how do you buy eggs? He said, we buy them frozen. I said, what the hell is that? He said, we don't use eggs like you think we do. We have them frozen in a tub, you know, like five gallon tin. And we scoop them out with an ice cream scooper and that's how we use our recipes. 
We haven't got time to break eggs. I said, really? I said, will you be interested in buying my cracked or broken eggs? He said, if you take them out of the shell, I am. Hmm. Now so I you find, want to take the eggs. Now I find up. out I could make twice as much selling broken eggs than I can. You break them all. Thanks. Right. Really? Yeah. So this is, um, <laughs> well, I'm telling you, this is a lot of fun. And then the Mike Douglas show calls. That's a different talk show. Apparently, at Mike Kerb, the producer of the Mike Douglas show, had seen me at the Rainbow Grill. I didn't, I didn't know that. And I thought because I was on the Tonight Show, he bought me. He bought me because he liked me. So you were still doing the Rainbow Grill while this is all going on. Oh no, it was only a two week gig. That was it. That was it. That was it. Okay. Yeah. And so, is this all right? Me rambling. Uh, no, you just keep going. Because okay. I, I have so many questions, and I don't want to interrupt you because all right, it's so. Still, I'm mesmerized. Listen to this. So now, I can't figure out how to break these eggs because that's a big chore. <laughs> so I figure I'll hire kids at the school to break the eggs. Yeah. Because I'm going to make twice as much on the broken eggs. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm just buying eggs from old McDonald like you Everybody, wouldn't believe. You break them all. And I got now eight, ten kids. I I gave up a bay in the gas station to break the eggs. Why did this guy do it himself? Lazy. Bakers make a lot of money. I guess he never thought, you know, I, he should diversify he's into that. He's a niche. Yeah. I mean, he's making cakes. He's making money. He's a, you know. I got to so, tell you something. It's something right. I wrote down like, like 20 minutes ago. I'm listening to you talk. Creativity. This is common among everybody that I've had on the show. Um, it's creativity and solving problems and seeing things other people don't see. I'm, that's what I'm hearing. Go ahead. Uh, you know. But it comes back to how you grew up. There's it, an old, it's, the, right, you, necessity. You necessity. You know, okay. uh, there's an old saying that a hero and a coward have the same emotion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The hero fights yeah. and the coward runs away. But they're both just as scared. And I know for a fact that's true because I've been through it. I have to assume you're going to like write a book and there's a movie coming. We have a book in the works I mean, right this now. is ridiculous. <laughs> okay. So. I want to play the baker. <laughs> so. I'm so busy with all of that. And I meet a friend of mine who I knew from the days I would follow my brother in bowling centers when he was on his way up. And oh, wait, yeah, your brother's bowling all the whole time yeah, while you're doing Yeah, all this, this time he's winning national titles, right. And so, and I, that was my biggest fun. Yeah. I never even You love watching him be successful. Oh, to yeah. see your brother yeah. beat the best yeah. in the world yeah. on national TV, that's, you can't explain that. Uh, especially if you love your brother, you yeah. know. And uh, I mean, I, here I am. Uh, I stopped the poker game on the PBA tour because I was on the Tonight Show. They stopped for only, and first time in history. I mean, when when Kennedy got shot, they didn't stop the poker game. But when I was on the Tonight Show, they did. So <laughs> you can understand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was more fun for me to watch my brother than for what I was doing. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I meet this guy, guy who I'm friends with. He's a tile man. And he hates his life. There's so much wrong. He said, I want to be a builder. I said, well, how do, what do you know about building? He said, I've been working with builders for 30 years or 20 years, so more like 20. He said, this piece of cake to build a house. He said, it's chronological order. That's all it is. And I thought, well, I never saw a house with sheet rock on the outside and shingles on the inside. There must be something to this. So we talked. And he said, Peter, I'm telling you, if I could put the money together, I can build houses and we can make a fortune. So I'm thinking, well, well, let me see what I can do. So I call a real estate guy. He wants to build what they call single and separate spec homes, where you just find an empty hole in a development or on the side of the road, you build a house and try to sell it. I'm thinking more like doing track houses. Like a development. Development, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Stop in the real estate office, and this guy shows me a 10-acre parcel in the next town from Islip. It's called Sayville. Uh, says you could, this would subdivide to 24 houses. So I thought, geez, 24 houses. So to my friend, uh, start putting the numbers together. Start thinking we could make 10,000 a house. We could buy the lot for five. We could build a house for 30. 
it would cost us about 5000 per house if you divide up sidewalks, streets, sewers, curbs, all the things you have to do. And uh, I learned all about that. And Obviously then, you did it because you know it. Yeah, <laughs> you said so, uh, 10,000 hats, 24 hours is 240,000. Well, Back then, it was like what, a million bucks. Well, well a couple of million. 1973, like. yeah. 240,000 is yeah. a lot bigger than yeah. it is you know, now. So you did it. Oh, shit. Yeah. How'd you get oh, the money? I'm sorry. No, so well, I didn't have the money. Had to, yeah. You had to put, I learned all about how you can um, put down, well, nobody believed this. 25% down on the parcel and give that what they call 125% release per parcel. Once you get a subdivision done and you've got your 24 houses, they give you the first lot for free so you can build your model. Who's that? The owner of the land. Okay. Under the contract, you put up the 25%. Oh, you 20, didn't buy the land? Well, I was in the process of okay. it. You put up 25000 and then you... Uh, you get that first lot you can build your model on. And as you sell houses, whatever the divisional number is, the 20 houses, the 23 houses left to the 75, you pay that and 25% more, and they'll release a lot every time you need it. So now I'm learning about that. Interesting. Interesting. Very interesting. It is. So now I need 20, but I'm always chasing money because... I'm in so many businesses, and each one of them requires somebody. Well, they're all going now. You got the yeah, they're all you got operating. The gas station, you got uh, laundromat, cracking the eggs, or? and cracking the eggs. That was my favorite. That's <laughs> the best business I've ever <laughs> been in. Uh, but the laundromat runs itself. The money yes. comes in. And I learned that if you buy, at the time they would call Wascomat washers and dryers. No GE, no, no Frigidaire, none of that crap. No Maytags. The ones made in Germany called Wascomats. They never break. Never. It's like a Mercedes. Oh, exactly. <laughs> they just run forever. So, and the worst neighborhood you put them in, you open up in, the more people don't have any money, so they don't have houses. With cash washers. Cash. They don't have houses with washer dryers, so yeah. they're going to utilize the, the laundromats more. Especially so that's what you were doing. Oh, yeah. How many did you have? Just that one or just one? Oh, no. Immediately. Every time we paid one off, we opened that another one. one. So we had uh, eight at one time. Still driving the caddy? Uh, in Lincoln now. Oh, yeah. yeah Lincoln. Now, big I got a Mark IV. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, you know, I'm having fun in, in all the businesses except show business. Because what a brick wall that was every time. What I did wasn't in sync with what was going on. For example... It was when I got drafted, the kind of music I do. But when I get out of the service, because of the Beatles and the two years that went by, the whole British invasion happened. Songs like Eve of Destruction were on number one. Mm -hmm. And that's not me at all. I, I don't sing songs about yeah, yeah, Eve of Destruction. Yeah. So, you know, being a love song singer, a ballad singer, I was really against the grain. So, although I got encouraged a lot, I also got discouraged a lot. I also went long periods, two, three, four months with nothing. And then something would happen to give me a chance at show business. I'd get rejuvenated. My ambition would get rejuvenated in show business. There were people at that time that were singing those songs, though. I mean, they were... Oh, yeah. I mean, they were already established. A, yeah. I guess there was a couple of years ago. Barry Manilow came in. Maybe it was, that was the late later. 70s. That's late. That's much that later. That was later. Yeah, I'm talking about 71, 72, 73. Yeah, so, well, I mean... Yeah. There was no Barry Manilow no, in 73. Now you're talking like, yeah. who, who was coming? Allman Brothers, maybe? Were, were pop, like, rock and roll was popping up. Like, Southern yeah, Rock. But, and like, but it was more like... Uh, it wasn't yet the Eagles or those groups. Was, that was but, just before all that. But there were just a whole bunch of folk groups were having hits. And Elvis had the same problem. I mean, you watch movies about him. Exactly. It, it changed. It he hit changed. a low in there where, yeah. where he became... In a very f f short period, a dinosaur. Yeah. In his own right, you know, yeah. because what he did. He was a legend already, but if he wasn't, he wasn't selling, he right. would have had a problem. Yeah. Uh, and that periodically does go on, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, every, everybody could have. Sinatra was hot as hell and then he was dead, you yeah. know. Yeah. And then he made a comeback. But yeah. there are a lot of acts that didn't make comebacks, you know. and uh, Both and, of them. Yeah, uh, that's I mean, right. Yeah. And, and for example, the rock and roll groups that had all the hits in the 50s, the Coasters, the Drifters, and all those groups, uh, people like Frankie Avalon, and the, 
they were hot as hell and they went so cold that most of them left the business and got jobs. Yeah. You know, yeah. driving trucks, whatever they could yeah. do. And then when it became a renaissance again and it, it, it started to rejuvenate, sometimes 10, 12, 15 years later, they got back into it. Yeah. Because there was a demand again. By 1973, yeah. I... I I meet a guy named Joe Scandori who manages Don Rickles. Oh, and I meet I've him by accident. Him. Uncle of mine, who was a bookmaker in Brooklyn, told me to go and see him. And he, uh, although he lived in California, he also had a house in Brooklyn. So uh, you, that was the Westchester Theater? No, no, not yet. Almost. Okay. Westchester Theater was 1976. Because yeah. uh, he was one of the, he was part owner of that, right? No, that was... Am I confusing uh, him with somebody yeah, else? Yeah, you are. But okay. I'll get to, I'll, I'll, right. I'll fix that. Um... So anyway, so I meet him, and I find out that Don Rickles is going to play the Copacabana in September. This is March. And I said, boy, I would really like to open for him. He said, you and everybody in show business, every single the best business. ever. Yeah. I lay in bed and watch him at night still. Nobody's better I than watch Don Rickles. It's hysterical. Same stuff and over and, and over. when he did the Copacabana, it was wool yeah, to what yeah, They had 900 yeah. people in a place that held seven. And he didn't prepare. 750. He, he, just, he would just go. He was different every night. The funniest but he guy. Was funniest ever. Um, and the nicest guy ever, you know. Everybody's and, always said that. You know, of course, uh, we, we, know, we know people that knew him, and, and everybody so says the same thing. He says everybody in show business wants that spot. Everybody yeah. in the business comes to watch because they all want to see Rickles. He yeah, said, so yeah. everybody wants that. He says, you know how many favors I'd have to give up to give it to you? Anyway, I fly to his house in California. To Don no, Rickles? No, Joe Scandor. Scandor, okay, yeah. And I knock on his door, and he says, what the hell are you doing here? And I said, uh... I really want that spot on the dawn. I figured I'd come and ask for it. He said, what do you mean come and ask? Said, you fool here from New York? Why don't you call me? I said, well, over the phone, I thought it'd be a lot easier for you to say no. He said, boy, you want it that bad? And I said, yeah. He said, well, let me see what I could do. So he tells me, two weeks later, I got the spot. So now, wow. with all I'm doing, I'm building houses, I'm doing all the things I mentioned to you, and I'm dealing with a banker at the bank that I got all my financing from. And he doesn't know I'm a singer. This is the, I'm with him six months. We go to lunch all the time. And but he, he never realized that I was a singer. And I go in one day and I said, uh, I'm going to be gone for about two weeks. Uh, I'm going to be in New York working. He goes, working on what? He was aware of everything I was doing, but not had nothing to him in Manhattan. I said, well, actually, I'm going to be uh, singing. He says, you sing? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, he said, come on. What are you? I said, no, it has to be true. I, I'm going to sing. He said, well, where are you going to sing? I said, uh, the Copacabana. He goes, the Copacabana? What are you? He said, is this a joke? He said, no, I'm going to be at the Copacabana for two weeks. I said, but then I'll be back and I'll be doing it. He goes, come on. He said, well, who are you going to be with? I said, um, I was like, intimidated to say it. I said, right. uh, Don Rickles. And he goes, the Don Rickles? He says, come on. I said, well, pick up the phone and call him. So I give him the phone number. It's like 212-760-1060. To call Don Rickles? No, call the Copacabana. Oh, I'm trying to follow you. Call the Copacabana and see who's going to open it next Thursday. Right. So he calls up. He says, excuse me. He says, please, can you tell me who's uh, going to be appearing there next Thursday? Yeah. He said, uh, the opening uh, show opening Thursday is Don yeah. comedian Don Rickles and singer Peter Lemongello. And he yeah. drops the phone. He goes, what the hell is this? You're singing with that. Don Rick's the biggest star in show business right, at the time. Right, right. Well, he comes to see me with his wife and his dentist and his wife. Yeah. Uh, his wife. And when the gig is over after two weeks, he says, are you crazy? Why are you not doing What are you doing building houses and laundry mats? What are you nuts? You could be a star. He's what do you think? It's easy to be a star. <laughs> so I tell him. I've been trying for years. Yeah, I've been trying yeah. for five years yeah. already. Yeah. Yeah. Well... I explained to him, I signed with Epic Records. They didn't push the record. I got dropped. After that, try to get a record deal. Once you've been dropped by a label, you have to move a mountain to get another deal. Oh, you so you did have a deal. I, I got it. I got a deal with Epic Records. They had seen me at a nightclub. They liked me, and they signed me. So in there somewhere that happened. Yeah, seventy two. Okay. okay. Anyway. Like while you're doing all the businesses. Well, I was happened. doing everything. Yeah. Okay. I flew out to LA and I okay. made three records for Epic. Okay. Uh, I just had different hats. 
whatever, if it was Tuesday and I was in show business, if there was a gig, I went and did it or, you know, show, but it had to be, yeah, yeah. have some consequence yeah, hustler. or I wouldn't yeah. have done it, you know, because uh, yeah. I was too busy. Yeah. Anyway, this guy, Bob, who was the manager of the bank, he said, what would it take for you to be a star? I said, well, can't answer that question, but I can tell you this. I was watching a, a commercial the other night for a company called Crazy Eddie's. <laughs> and I thought that was a, I thought to be on TV that you had to have, be Procter & Gamble or, you know, Colgate. This guy has two stores and he's all over TV. So I got to find out. But if I can make an album and buy spots on TV, I might be able to be a star. Because even if the album doesn't sell, I'm going to get famous. So I'll make a fortune working live. So he helped me raise the money. Businessmen that he knew. Yeah, yeah. That he originally started out and now they've succeeded. And that's how that whole thing was born. And before you know, we went on TV and I, nobody was more shocked than I was that we sold a million eight hundred thousand records. I never expected that. I was just. There was a name. What that was? I was it was called Love Seventy Six. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you know, uh, I did it all. I went to the pressing plant, made the deal for them. To, I brought in the cardboard things that you slide the albums in. I brought in the printing that they put on the albums. Um, so it worked. Yeah. I mean, it but worked. I did everything myself. Nobody ever helped. I tell me I, something. I don't mean that in a bragging way. I just mean I didn't have a team. Are you ready? Where in there did you get kidnapped? Oh, that's... <laughs> I had to ask you. All right. Years did it later. happen already? No. Okay. A few years later, uh, a cousin of mine who pitched for Houston Astros yeah. uh, got thrown out of baseball, and I tried to help him. He got jealous of all the money I had, and he actually kidnapped me because uh, he knew I had $100,000 in my safe deposit box. And he wanted to steal it. So he kidnapped me and a friend of his held me at gunpoint while he went into the bank with my brother, who also had access to the safe deposit box. He kidnapped you and your brother. Yeah, and they took the money. So what you have to follow yeah. with the book. Yeah, and the rest of it's okay. the rest of it's in there. I never so got you, the money back. But. So you can't so I'm just how, how did they take you? Like they just come on, come with me. Like, like, no. Was it like violent? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, he uh, pulled up in a van. My brother and I were standing uh, on a lawn, talking. We were just talking. And he uh, had a gun. And, and I he was, was, you saw it was him. He, I realized like who he was. But he wasn't I wearing anything. Like, he wasn't like no, hiding himself. I didn't believe it. I didn't even know why he was being kidnapped. He said, get in a van, and I wouldn't. <laughs> so he hit me on the head with the gun. He half split my head open. And uh, that convinced he, he's me. He's a successful guy. He's a, a professional athlete. Well, he had been thrown out of baseball. Oh, he, thrown out. I didn't even say yeah, that. Yeah, he was, he was on the Houston Astros. And then he got traded for bad behavior to uh, um, the Toronto Blue Jays. Yeah. And then he got thrown out of bad baseball guy. for I mean, bad behavior. Yeah, he's he your first lose, cousin. Yeah, he used to lose. He was my father's brother's kid. So anyway, yeah, we were first cousin. Um, long story short, I got in the car. The friend of his... Held my brother at gunpoint while he brought me into the bank to uh, get the money out. Uh, the reason he got caught was because I was bleeding, and the bank president saw that I was yeah. bleeding, so he realized something was wrong. And uh, but they got the money. They did, I, and I never got it back. And you know, what just, happened to him? He he. They gave him probation for a few years. You know, what uh, happened? Get probation. You know what? In the state of Florida, and this happened in Florida. Oh, I'm thinking this is in New York. No, in the state of Florida, if you commit a crime with a gun, uh, you're supposed to get three years automatically. But um, I really believe that the cops were baseball fans, <laughs> you know, because they they said in well, Florida, it wasn't. Think it happened. They said it wasn't really a, a gun because he he said he had blanks in it. Um, I don't know about you, but if you're staring down a pistol, you don't look to see if they're blanks are real. You know, <laughs> nobody could do that. Nobody's got that much guts. So that's a very short answer for what have you. Read the book, you'll see the rest. All right, and the next question, which I told you before I was going to ask you, tell me about, about, about Joe Palumbo. Okay. Uh, Not about the, him, but goes, about, about, I mean, how do you even know him? Goes back. I met him. Uh, and for, by the way, for anybody watching this who doesn't know who that is, just 
say who that was. He was the head of the Colombo family. Uh, you know, there were five families in New York. Yes. Gambinos, Colombos, yes. Bananos, uh, Frenches, and uh, who the hell else? I forgot the fifth one. <laughs> Banano? Oh, well, yeah, I said Banano. You did? Uh, let me see. Uh, who's that crazy guy in... Oh, the guy in the village. Yeah. That took the, wore the robe. He wore uh, in his pajamas. Yeah, yeah. yeah the chin. Yeah, yeah. Vin, Vinny the chin was yeah. there, right? That was the uh, Franchise family. Yeah. And then there was the Columbos and the... That worked for a long time, by the way. Yeah. A long he time. He fooled everybody. For a long time. Anyway, I uh, met a guy in a, in a... I guess you call it a luncheonette in Manhattan. Just It was cold. We went in and my cousin and I... We were banging on doors in the New York City. same cousin? No, different. Oh. I'm banging on doors trying to get an agent when I first got started. First tried to get started. And we meet this guy. And my cousin, I just say hello to the guy, but my cousin tells him, wow, he's a great singer. And the guy says, wow, I noticed he's real good looking. If he could sing anywhere near as good as he looks, I can help him. And we got friendly. And it like turns that. out his cousin was Joe Colombo. Okay. So I got involved with them, Joe Colombo and Carmine Persico and other... Uh, names that were in yeah. that family. Were they actually helpful? Did it even make yeah. a difference? Oh, it did make a difference. And then what happened? He was going to put me in The Godfather to play Johnny Fontaine. It was all set. Oh, man, I could see that. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, that, I met Francis Ford yeah. Coppola and, and Al Ruddy, who was the producer. Coppola was the director. And I look on Ruddy's desk when I went for my audition and it said, Lemon Jello must use. So I knew I was in before I auditioned. So I really relaxed and did a pretty good audition. Because I, I tell them, I didn't have to act. I mean, that's my life. So, you know, I, I just I just be myself, and, and I could be Johnny Fontaine. So, being as big a Sinatra fan as I was, I you know I thought I could do it. I would have had it. It was all set to go. So I'm standing 20 feet from Joe Colombo when he got shot in, Colum in it, Columbus it was Circle, Circle, right? Yeah. In Columbus Circle, he got shot in the head. It was like Italian Day or something. It was, it was the a big uh, festival, right? It was the Italian American Civil Rights League. Rally. There was a rally. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he got shot. Um, you were right there. I was 20 feet away. I was the only one. I was talking to Carmine and, and Alley Boy, the two underlings of his. Mm -hmm. and they thought there were firecrackers. I said, I just came home from Vietnam. I said, I'm telling you, that's a fucking rifle. Uh, or, I mean, a pistol. That's, that's, not a, that's not a firecracker. So I look and he's down. They didn't know what to do. They they scrambling right away trying to figure out who did it. And uh, within a week, I lost the Johnny Fontaine role. Um, and they told me they were just indicted and they were going to prison, so they couldn't help me. And I was uh, back to my own businesses so on they Long enjoyed, Island. They enjoyed hanging out with you because you were yeah, singing. You were I a guess. fun guy. Well, they like, yeah. yeah, maybe, and they yeah. really liked showbiz. They loved. I thought them. they could help you. It would be they, fun. And they and they could pull any string they wanted. Yeah get away with it in those days but those were the ups and downs i mean it'd be really great and then yeah. i'd have nothing wow, so many of them you know i signed with epic records thinking this is going to be it and then i'd have nothing and do a couple of tonight shows but you know afterwards nobody called and said do you want a series of your own you know uh sometimes that happens sometimes it doesn't uh so there's a lot of ups and downs but i never really minded the patience that i had to Continue with until I found Love 76, you know, uh, because I was making so much money in my other businesses. I was a pretty happy guy and as busy as you can possibly believe. So uh, I didn't, I didn't even notice the gaps when I had nothing going on in show business because I was so busy. Did you save any of the money? Of course. You hear stories. I mean, people, they, they blow all the money. Well, you know? <clears throat> uh, you do have a tendency to go through a lot of money, yeah. wouldn't you? I mean, you sold out MSG. Madison Square Garden? Yeah. Three hours. Well, that's my information back. No, yeah, we did. So, I mean, that's profitable. You made a couple of dollars. So, <laughs> these are these are big. You sold out major places. Or, or, or and, you know, that's a pretty shocking thing. Uh, first concert ever. When Love 76 got me so hot that I couldn't walk on the streets because we were running 100 commercials a week. And I was just so hot, you know. Uh, the people placing the ad said, you have to do a concert. And I said, where? I said, How, well, we'll check. So said, well, Lincoln Center is available next month, April 7th. And I said, well, how many seats does it have? And they said, 
2800 I said, what are you guys, crazy? <laughs> he said, don't worry, you'll be fine. Every secretary in New York's going to buy a ticket. And they, they sold in three hours. I was more shocked than anybody. You know, I mean... Uh, but MSG is like, what, 25,000 seats? Oh, no, I was in the uh, felt form. It was 4,600 okay. seats. Okay. But it did That's sell a out, lot of people. But it did sell out twice in one night. That's a so lot So it was really 9,200 people. Do you really get paid well for the like if you sell five thousand seats, or is everybody taking the money? There's all these so many people involved. Always, but uh, Mad Square Garden was my biggest payday. I made ninety two thousand in one night. How much? Ninety two in one night. What year was that? Seventy six. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money now. Yeah, but it's even it's more than back yeah. then. It was, it was like five times as much. Wow. Yeah. So I. Uh, uh, all right. You so, get a so little flabbergasted at this stuff, but you know. It hits you so fast. Sometimes you don't even realize it. So, th th so it came. So that all happened. Right? It, all, mm -hmm. it, was, it all. So, <laughs> when that was going on, you kept all the businesses. Yeah, little by little, I started to uh, sell them off to my partners because I just couldn't do it. You were anymore. getting busy. I mean, you're really yeah. busy. I mean, we're show busy, business. So much busier. Show business overtook. Uh, everywhere I went, I mean, I was drawing crowds of girls. They were following me. You know, I couldn't go to a Seven Eleven or a supermarket or. What does that feel like? I don't mean I don't mean to be funny. I mean, what does it feel like when you actually it impacts like your your freedom to go places? Like you don't always it's want pretty, that happening. It, it's pretty awful. It's, it's sometimes it's really wonderful at others and, and a lot of fun. Um, for example, you can't go to a restaurant and enjoy yourself because of people always coming over and bothering you. And you and, want to be nice to people. Yeah, but they get pretty um, they they get pretty ridiculous. You know, I mean, they'll come over and they'll say, uh, it depends on her education level, but they'll say, my, my wife wants to meet you. And I said, well, all right, bring her over. No, we want you to come to our table. Get the hell out of here. I'm not going to get, I'm eating. You want me to get up and come to, what are you kidding? And they thought that was perfectly fine. They asked me to get up. So now I had bodyguards with me to shuffle them around, you know. You did. I had to. So how long did that last until it calmed down again? About three years. That's a long time. Yeah. That's a long time. Uh, so what? So then? So the, I mean, things change, right? That music that you sing, it, it is. Um, well, know, disco and like change. My albums were disco albums. Okay. And '76, that was the hottest thing. Right. But by 1978, '79, disco had kind of dissipated to the point where I would have had to come up with another. Were you in the studio to, of '54 world? Oh yeah. You you yeah yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. All those you know. In places like Lutes and the Four Seasons and places. Like I mean, there are some people like down here, um, you know, the Bee Gees. Did you ever get to meet those guys? The one remaining, I think, is, is that Barry? He lives here in Miami. I don't think so. No. You know? It's just such a cool time. That does it. Yeah, it's I mean, like a, I, thought, I thought I met everybody, but not so many in the same business I was in. Yeah. You know, like all the comics you could possibly name, superstar comics I, I knew, almost every singer. I mean, I had. Sinatra called me to Jilly's one night because he wanted to meet me. And because uh, he heard what I had done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sitting there having so and I and who's crossing me where you are is but Jackie Kennedy. And I had no idea she was there. I was so in awe of, of him. I was kind of staring at him, answering his questions and things. And I looked up and there there was Jackie Kennedy. And I, and I, I couldn't so, and she said, I love your singing. I've seen your commercials. I said, Is she talking to me? You know, I mean, that, but, that's surreal. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's, that's impossible surreal. to do. John Kennedy's wife just said that yeah, to that's me. That's surreal. So, I mean, I've had experiences I can't describe, but I never really got friendly with other singers that much. Maybe because when I was working, they were, you know, but it sometimes it wasn't even my fault. Like, uh, I've never talked to Frankie Valley because he hated me. And that's because when I did my first. Uh, Lincoln Center concert. His wife wanted to come and see me, and she didn't go see him that night. She went to see me, and he became mad at me. Well, that's that's Italian for you. He's <laughs> <laughs> he's mad at me. I didn't met the guy, and I never met her. You know, uh, what the hell's he mad at me? He's mad at his wife. Right? Yeah. Uh, so we're, we have like five minutes left, right? Right. and I want I want to. You're still performing. And no. 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 When did, when's the, when, when did you stop performing? I, about thought, five, I thought maybe you did it for fun or maybe no, you were still doing something. No? About five years ago, I stopped. Okay. But what I do now is when my son Peter Jr. is doing a show, he does a tribute to me. He does my hit record, Do I Love You? 
and I come out and join him for the last chorus. Oh my God, how does that feel? Ah, uh, the best. And we do it together, and it's just we end it together, and it's just the you best. And I get a, an incredible reaction from the audience, and that's fun. Does know? he sound like you? No, he's really good, but he doesn't sound like you. He's still he's, his voice is still higher than mine. Yeah. Mine it was had a deeper, they, they more sound resonant. Good together? They, they, yeah, they, according they, to my life, yes. Yeah. Karen um, says we sound great. We sound great together. Okay. So as long as she, a, long as she likes it, I'm happy. Yes, <laughs> that's a long journey. It is. I mean, so many things happened, but from nine years old to the, the, the experience you had, you made something happen over and over and over. And that's in, in the beginning. I said about the, the point of this show is to inspire, motivate people. And like your entire story, I mean, it's fun, right? It's fun because of what you did, but the same theme is in there. Like you, you, you were creative. You solved problems. You saw around corners that other people didn't see. I mean, the things you did, it, it, it makes it so interesting. It's gonna be a great book. It's gonna be a Thank great you. movie. Uh, because I think everybody can relate in some way to having a hard time and having to figure something out. And that's really, it, it, but you did it a lot, like over and over and over. That's what you're forced to do sometimes. Yeah. But in reality, I don't think about my story. When you told me yours before we started this interview. I was kind of envious of how clever you were. So when you told me what you had done. So the truth is that uh, the other guy always seems smarter to you than you are. You know, you, it's almost like survival. Well, at, it's at the always time, it felt survival. like survival. Always. You know? Find your own but not way. Everybody can do that. No, but when you, when you start out for a career move, I don't care what career you choose. Yeah. Nobody's going to say, well, let me give you 500 a week until you make it. It doesn't happen that way. You have to find a way to live and you pursue can. your drove, career drove, at the same time. I drove a forklift on the loading docks in Newark Airport for like a year, midnight shifts, you know, loading go. trucks. Like, and I could tell oh, the things I did just to make money. Hard to believe, but I believe you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, now I can I can look back and I didn't think about it. You just do. I, I drove a truck for two and a half years up and down the East Coast. Like, you just do what you got to do. And I had no money, but I was always running, chasing something. The same way that you described it, like you were going after something, and the clock was ticking. You know, you know what? You just made me laugh because after about three or four years in show business, I finally got a job where I earned. I said, oh, they pay you to sing? I, I did so many things in show business and lost money at it just to try to gain some stature in the business that it became funny to me. Like, I know in all my other businesses I could earn money, but I didn't really think you ever earned money singing. You got a very light, upbeat, pleasant, positive like energy. Was it always like that? I think so. Yeah. I, Which I, is uh, very it's magnetic. That that's a magnetic thing. I think that regardless of whether you can sing or not sing, you're you're, you're you have a magnetic energy. You just just smile. No, just, thank just, you very much. The way I, you tell a story. I is think it's more that I I just had so much fun doing the things I described to you, um, and I just always felt fortunate to be able to be that free. Maybe that's because the army took my freedom away for two years uh, wow, so and funny. scared me so, so much. So funny you just you know? said that. I was talking with these guys last night, and they were telling me that when you join the military, you become the property of the government. You bet. And they were telling me about, about what that means and what it feels like, and you just said the same thing. Oh, you know, it doesn't just happen if you join, like that gentleman when he joined the Marine Corps. You get drafted. They make you sign a, a document that says that the Congress of the United States keep you for the rest of your natural life if they choose to do it. So you are really in prison without ever having committed a crime. And they let you out when they want to let you out. I mean, don't forget, my father was in World War II. He was in five years. In, those, in that era, in that war, they kept you for the duration plus six months, so nobody knew when they were getting out. It's pretty awful. I'd, I, I'd say that, but it really is. Peter, this is one of the most interesting shows. I think this is episode 50 or something. I've interviewed <laughs> some interesting people, but you're definitely like... Uh, you've been it's, it's, a terrific interview. It's, uh, thank uh, you. It's just fun. It's, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I feel like I want to ask you more, but I know that you guys have a book That's coming right. out. No, so I mean, I, 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 there's things that you have to hold on, hold on to for the book. I happen to watch the interview you did with David uh, Wiseman. Oh, yeah. And he was terrific. Yeah. But David's great. During yeah. the time that I watched that interview, I, I knew we were going to do one. And I said, well, I'm going to really enjoy that because this guy's a great interviewer. Thank so you. I'd, I'd like to thank you for having me on. That's really awesome. <laughs> thank you. Well, hold on. You were on a Tonight Show 25 times. Yeah, but this was just as much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get any better than that. This is the last show. Is it, not? it has to be. It's Johnny Carson. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, Greatest listen, feeling in the you. world. Thank you. Is to watch tonight's show all your life and then sit in that seat and be interviewed after you sang. So that I've had it was some, a dream. Like you, you I've, lived your dream. I've had you a lot of dreams dream. come true. Yeah, I really have, and I'm very fortunate. And you're living a phenomenal life now. Yes, I have the best wife in the world. Yeah. And a son that really has a great singing. chance, Peter Lovejoy Jr., might just pop through and be a big star. He's got the talent, there's no question. That's a great segue. So this camera over my shoulder is your camera. <laughs> share anything you'd like to share for anybody that ever watches this. This is going to be out there forever, um, where they can reach you, maybe with your son. Anything you want to share? Um, website? Well, we both have websites. Social media? Mine is uh, PeterLemonJello.com, and his is PeterLemonJelloJr.com. And you okay. can technically get to us, actually get to us through those. You could okay. ask for us to call you back. But the thing I tell everybody is that it's so important for you to enjoy what you're doing. There isn't anything better than to be working at something you really love. So if you don't love it, change it. And if you do love it, don't ever quit. Phenomenal. Phenomenal message. Thank you. Beautiful message. So... Uh, thank you. I, I really appreciate you thank coming you for and doing us. this. It, was, it really was a good time. Yeah, it was a great time. I had a glass of wine, too. <laughs> well, no, no, we haven't got 20 minutes. Um, we do this show to inspire, to motivate, and to help you reach your potential. So I, I hope that there was some value in this today. That's that's what it's all about. There were so many stories. Um, it, it's hard to, to even pick which was the, the best one. But ups and downs. And, and I think that when there's a, a down, there's always an opportunity to see something you know, and to actually find that up. And, uh, and that's like, there's a lot of messages. You know, the worst things could happen to you, but there's always an upside. There's always something that you can turn that around with. So it's almost, like playing poker. it's almost like playing poker. When you lose the hand, that's when you learn something. That's right. When you win the hand, you don't, to learn. When you win, you don't learn a thing. That's it. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you for again. having me. Thank you again. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, maybe we'll do a second show after your book comes out. Okay. Anytime. Oh, and by the way, there's a book coming out. <laughs> yes, there is. Is. It, is the book written? It's called uh, Tenacity Beyond the Mafia. Killer name. Peter Lemon Jones. No pun intended. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks again. Thank you.